Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It is the 20 podcast bringing you interviews with the best DJs, producers, and music industry professionals from around the globe. I'm your host, DJ Spider. DJ Spider. That is right. We are here coming to you from Los Angeles. Beat Source represent. This podcast is brought to you by Beat Source. And if you don't know what it is, well, I'm going to let you know. It's the new digital music service for open format DJs. Make sure you get on there. We've got Beat Source Link giving you the ability to DJ from the cloud and from our amazing library of songs and our custom curated playlists that are done by some amazing curators. Um, we've got all types of new things coming out. Uh, and what I want, I need to let you know about is a webinar series that we've got launching. Uh, Beat Source and Serato have come together to create three webinars that will be happening June 23rd for the West Coast of the United States, June 30th for the East Coast of the United States, and July 7th for the UK. Each show will include hosts from each brand, Serato and BeatSource, and will cover Serato's products, BeatSource Link, a demo, two guest speakers that are DJs in the virtual streaming space who have utilized this past year to engage and increase their following, create revenue stream and leverage opportunities. So this is definitely be helpful for you to get back in the swing of things, to learn no matter where you are in your career. So head over to this link to sign up right now and reserve your spot, link.beatsource.com slash what's dash next. And make sure you listen through this episode. My guest today is part of these webinars and he will be explaining to you in more detail in this episode what you will get out of them and we will give you that link again. You can always just rewind and listen to it. Uh, thank you guys for supporting. Thank you for being here. Uh, as always, hit me if you want uh, any info, you wanna talk, you wanna just say some nice things or some mean things, whatever you want, I'm here for you. Uh, find me on Instagram at DJ Spider, DJ S-P-I-D-E-R, same thing on twitch make sure you rate and review this podcast on the apple podcast app give us those five stars help us grow up the charts thank you to my beat sorcerers and all the loyal listeners and now i want to let you know about our amazing guest that we've got today our guest is hailing from london england and is the artist relations rep and so much more for serato in all of europe his dj career to me is like a book of many chapters he's you know, all over the place in a good way. And it's cool to hear how he connected the dots. Um, going from a battle DJ where he won the UK DMC battle competition in 2004, as well as many other battles before and after, uh, to being a radio DJ and presenter on the BBC, uh, then working for Activision for four years, helping to create the video game DJ Hero, um, and then going on to work with Daniel Pemberton, the composer, to do the scratches in the score of the amazing movie Welcome to the Spider-Verse, which was so mind-blowing to me, and I was so happy to learn more about that. Um, he will be part of the webinar that I mentioned earlier and was super fun and interesting to talk to. So let's get into it. Please welcome to the show, DJ Blakey. All right, you guys, we're here. It's the 20 podcast. We have got DJ Blakey from the UK. Give it up. Oh, there's the crowd. They're here. They're rocking That's with you. Blakey. I've had the crowd for a while. I want to give you that feeling of being back to real life. Okay, there you go. <laughs> How you feeling? I'm good. I'm 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 all good. We've just had summer hit in London, which is when it comes around, people lose their minds. We don't get much of it. And when it hits, it just it becomes the best city in the world. And everyone's happier when it's sunny. Um are I you know. on the West Coast in the US? I am. I'm on the West Coast. I'm in Los Angeles. So we, you know, have a somewhat opposite thing where it's nice here all the time people take it for granted yeah. um and then it can also get insanely hot so like today it's about to be tomorrow it says it's you know i know we're on fahrenheit so it's a little bit different but it says that it's supposed to be 106 fahrenheit where i live which is insane wow. and las vegas is going to be almost 120 uh fahrenheit to tomorrow so it's hot out here right now Damn. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's hot. I mean, before obviously we didn't go out to LA in 2020, but usually we go out to Anaheim every year for Nam. Right. And 
I always cannot believe how hot it is. And that's winter over there. Like you guys have it so <laughs> good. We get maximum, we get say three months of like mostly okay weather. Um, right. But yeah, it's just started. So everyone's really happy here at the moment. That's great. I agree that London is one of the greatest cities on the planet Earth. It's one of my favorite places uh, that I've ever been. I've gone a few times when it's cold and when it's warm, but um, just, you know, that's where so much of my love for DJing and music comes from. So I'm really excited to talk to you because that's where you're from and where you've come up and added so much to that scene out there. But, uh, you know, I, I, I fell in love with DJing here growing up in LA, but once I got out there, I remember seeing, I was in a bar hearing Giles Peterson for the first time and I didn't even know who he was. And this was back in the vinyl days and he was freaking the, some type of pioneer that had the loop thing on it and all this stuff. And it was just blowing my mind, all the different genres he was mixing together. And we were some dark bar, like down in like Piccadilly area or something. Um, and we would just go out buying records. I would go to every record store. And like we were talking about before, I'd buy those tape packs. We went to all these raves and fabric and we'd buy these tape packs of just, you know, 16 hours or however long it was of all the rave DJs and the MCs and Nikki Black Market and MC Question Marker. I can't remember. TC Islam, like all this crazy stuff from back in the day. So I That's agree. Dope. Big up London. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so that's great that it's like that. What um as far as like DJ life and you know, public going out, restaurants, nightclubs, bars, what's that like out there for a DJ? So right now it's mostly back to normal. Um okay. so you can you can DJ in um you can DJ outside, you can go to a restaurant at the moment. However, they were so what's the date now? It's the 14th of June. The plan was from the government. Well, the plan was to open up everything entirely and 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 get rid of all restrictions on Monday, the twenty first of June. They just announced that they're going to put that back four weeks, which which does suck. It means places like like Fabric, like you just mentioned, places like that can't open. I right. actually about an hour ago, I just saw Fabric put up a post on Instagram saying that they're not going to be able to open on the twenty first of June. Um, so. It, it, it's not great, but it could be worse. Uh, like right now, compared to how it's been through much of the last 12 to 18 months, it's pretty good. Like I, a really good sign is that I'm getting hit up by a lot of artists who are out in clubs and they're asking me about drivers and things like that and certain little issues right. that I need to help with, which is, which is really good to see because it means people are out there working. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty good compared to how it's been recently. That's so great to hear. That's crazy that they pushed it off. I remember because I follow so many uh, UK DJs on Twitch. So I would see different people saying like the 21st, here we go. Getting my body ready, summer body, <laughs> things like that. Um, <clears throat> we've all been stuck inside. But yeah, that's that's crazy. They pushed it back. Hopefully that date holds. I mean, we're in a similar thing. I'm in Los Angeles. So what is it? June 14th. So tomorrow was our date for that. June 15th is supposed to be the date that everything opens back up. I don't know what that means. Like I went to dinner with my wife last night and we still have to like wear a mask inside, you know, into the restaurant until we sit down and then we take it off. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. Just kind of, we've been following the rules and going with the flow and hopefully it it you know, gets back to normal here too, but it feels like it slowly is. And I hope it holds, yeah. you know, in the whole world, I hope we can get back to being interconnected and we can fly out there easily. And you guys can fly out here and could be at NAM in January and all that stuff. Yeah. It's definitely heading in the right direction. And I'm lucky enough to have had both of my vaccines and we're doing a really good job in this country of rolling out the vaccine and we're really privileged to have the vaccine. So it's all, yeah. it's all heading in the right direction, you know? Um, I'm positive. And like I said, people are out there DJing. It's just right now you can't DJ like underground in a dingy club, but soon that will happen. I'm sure of it. Right. I know it's a weird, I was saying this to someone like it's a weird time for DJing because everybody has that thing where they look at Instagram or something and go, Oh, well these people are doing this. I should be doing this, but it's hard to compare right now because everybody's in a different place and not all the places are open and 
maybe some smaller DJs that can work in smaller places or outside or for lower budgets are able to work more than people that are used to doing bigger events or things like that. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that has been great and, you know, we've been on and still active on is Twitch. Um, are you, you, you do Twitch weekly, right? Not at the moment I have. So I will be doing a regular stream on the Serato channel starting okay. very soon, actually starting from next month. So I have done quite a few streams on Twitch, um, mostly in preparation for this, uh, Got it. live stream I'm going to do on the Serato channel. Um, but it's great fun. I started doing it just to kind of practice it and sort of get used to the the new thing of, of you know, mixing the record, speaking on the mic, checking the chat. It was a totally alien thing to me. And to be honest, I felt like I was kind of late to to doing it. I only started doing it um, February, February, March time this year. Oh, so wow. I took to it fairly late. Um, but I'm glad I did. It's good fun, especially when you you, you don't even have to have a whole bunch of people watching just enough to get the chat going. Um, right. And then especially when you've got people in there who are into the same music that you're playing, it's good fun. It's really good fun. And that's been part of um, the artist relations role with Serato is helping DJs transition to streaming and get set up and, and get going with it. Um, yeah, it's been fun. That's great. Um, are you allowed to talk about what your show will be on Serato or should we just wait and see? Yeah. No, I can speak about it. So um, over on the Serato YouTube channel, you may have noticed a new series called Breaking In. Um, so Breaking In is simply one top-down shot of a controller or a mixer that I'm using to mix with and the um, Serato graphical user interface, so the, the virtual decks at the top. Um, right. And it's essentially it's to help us showcase hardware and genres of music that are not covered in our other content. So for instance, recently I did a breaking in with the new, um, new Mark party mix Two controller. Um, oh, okay. and every time we release a new controller or a new mixer, I'll be doing a video to go on YouTube and I'll also be doing a live stream to accompany it. So it, it up until now, it's just been a 10, 15 minute video on YouTube, but we're going to start doing a live stream too. And that will allow us to, um, have an educational slant to it as well. So people in the chat can ask questions about the controller and I can then answer them during the live stream. So yeah, it's, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be, it's going to be a great way of bringing some educational content to our Twitch channel, which we haven't done much of. Yeah, I agree. I think that's super cool. And it's a way people always have questions and there's other DJs that do things like that. And I noticed that so many DJs will flock to their channel and be asking, you know, from Mojax to yeah. Cleveland Terry um, to people like that. So uh, great. I'm excited to see that show, especially from you, someone that is so technical and knows so much and has inside of Serato, you know, and has all of the information. Yeah, thanks. I'm looking forward to it. It should be beginning from next month, um, and then it will be um, it will be regular. Not every week, but it will be a regular thing. Right. That's so cool. I love how Serato has been has really taken to Twitch and isn't afraid to experiment and do these beat making shows with Serato Studio and do like I said. I saw Cut Corners doing a podcast like this but live um, on there. I saw him interviewing, I think it was um, Jael or something, but it was so, you know, it's great to see. I love you guys embracing the, the platform and pushing the culture forward like that. Awesome. Yeah. And we're not stopping either. Twitch, Twitch is a long-term thing for us. And as you've just mentioned, we've really kind of diversified our content recently. So we're doing podcasts, we're doing more Serato studio content, but we're obviously going to carry on doing the DJ thing. But over the past 12 months, it's almost exclusively been DJ sets. So yeah, we're going to keep the DJ sets, but do more of everything else. Right. That's so cool. Um, and, um, and I don't know if this is something we could talk about or not, but does the um, copyright stuff, has that, a, I know they've had li recently something with the DMCA and Twitch seems fine with the live streaming, but has that affected any of your programming at all? The only thing that seems to affect um, for us and other DJs is playback. So as I'm sure you know, you get muted afterwards. 
Um, but yeah, I, I guess we're watching that um, situation closely. Um, but right now, seems to be all good live streaming on Twitch. Yeah, totally. Yeah, just the the playback and the video on demand. I know that really everybody says just delete your video on demand. So you can save them yourself, but don't have them up there. And especially don't let people make clips um, because that's where you can get dinged and pulled down. But then I see a lot of other people do it and it's totally fine. So who knows? Yeah, I mean, the thing is with leaving the videos up is there's not a whole lot of point leaving it up if it's just mostly muted, yeah. you know? Right. So yeah, we, we don't leave ours up, but obviously we leave up the Serato Studio stuff and all of the podcasts, so you can go and check those out. And they're also um, we're also going to be putting them up on our YouTube channel afterwards as well, where we can. It's not always possible, but where we can, you can go and check stuff out there afterwards. Right. I think people have figured out other things, like you see Scratch Bastard having his site, you know, Bastard's Barbecue, a subscription site, and then you're able to access his past sets and things there or some people probably have patreon pages or there's other ways that you could work it where if you record it you can still take the content that you've made and still utilize it in other ways yeah absolutely but yeah twitch i mean as as terrible as the past 12 to 18 months have been twitch has been a huge positive in the game huge like full stop yeah. It's been great, and I don't, I don't see it going anywhere. I think Twitch is a thing now that's here to stay, and it will be really interesting to see how many DJs choose Twitch over touring quite as much as they were. I'm sure touring will still happen for all of these, all of these DJs, but it will be interesting to see if people go like head first back into touring, or whether they kind of go half and half. You know, because. I, I'm not going to name any names, but I know people who are doing really well out of it. And it's great yeah. to see. I love it. Same. It's so cool to see. I wonder if there will be some sort of um, thing like how Mixcloud has the legal ability to do it. If Twitch will take that on or with or if Mixcloud will rise to the occasion and try to compete, get their service to compete with Twitch. Um, I know that they say that it does compete with Twitch, but I think that it doesn't have some of the features that the DJs are looking for yet. Um, but I do think that it has potential. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I think Mixcloud have done really well. I think um, without, I'm, I'm certainly not going to badmouth Mixcloud, but I would say, yeah, same. and hopefully, hopefully somebody hears this from Mixcloud, I think it would be really, really valuable if they introduced a similar thing to raiding on Twitch. I think that's huge. Huge. I think being able DJs being able to raid other DJs has is just an incredible way of showing love and just passing on, you know, just passing on love throughout the scene. It's amazing. I think That's what if, I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Raiding is the greatest thing in at the moment in DJing. It really is because whenever we're doing a stream on the Serato channel and, and it's one of my artists or, or I'm modding, I always raid one of the DJs that we're following and yeah. there's nothing there's nothing better than seeing the reaction of the DJ getting a raid from Serato where they're not expecting it. Like it's incredible. And it's really valuable. You you see raid trains all the time where DJs just DJ throughout the whole 24 hours and they'll just go from one DJ to the other. So I would love it if Mixcloud introduced something like that. And I think I think that'd be really good for them. I agree. Like that is such a huge tool. I don't understand why some other sites don't do it too, because over the pandemic, uh, that app clubhouse blew up pretty big and yeah. I had some great conversations on there. I would talk to people, listen to people, get into so many interesting things and they would just end. Some of them would have 5,000 people and they would just end. And I'm like, why do they not have rating on clubhouse? Like I would love yeah. I trust this person I'm listening to. They're telling me about whatever it is from cryptocurrency to, you know, whatever this topic is we're talking about, um, you know, DJing, music, this, that, live events. It would be great if they could go, okay, now we're going to raid into this and then you, you get to know more things. I feel like Clubhouse sort of fizzled out because it's impossible to discover. And it's the same thing on Mixcloud where it would be great if you could... The things I think would be great, like you said, if someone from Mixcloud is listening, is the rating feature, the ability to see how many people are watching you live at the time. I, maybe that's in there now, but it wasn't in there before when I was trying it. And I feel like that's just a pretty 
standard thing because you can measure is my channel growing and what's happening, you know, and is this that and then as well as the the encouragement of the tipping and the subscriptions like that's where Twitch has it because people say, oh, well, you could go do this on Facebook or you could go do this on, um, you know, uh, um, uh, whatever, all the YouTube and stuff like that. But really, like it's it's not um, encouraged, you know, the the tipping and all that stuff in there. So it's just kind of like Twitch has that culture built into it, which is helpful. Yeah. And DJs are good at it because we're out there like. Hey, go get another bottle or go tip your bartenders. You know, like we, we're salesmen in a way, you know, um, at these clubs trying to sell alcohol or help them sell art at an art gallery or whatever it is. We're trying to set this mood. So for us to sell subscriptions and bits and whatever is, is not that foreign. Yeah. And also, you know, it's it's easy to forget that Twitch um, if you're just a DJ and you haven't been into watching like gamers stream on Twitch, it's easy to forget yeah. how long Twitch have been building their thing for. Yes. You know, it's been years. I, I, I've I've watched Twitch over the years when certain video games come out. I'll jump on and check out the game, um, but it feels new to DJs. But that thing's been around a long time. So people yeah. and the people using Twitch, they understand the whole bits thing, and you know, it's it's all it's all been there for a long time. Um, and just little things like the fact that it's the fact that it is owned by Amazon, just being able yeah. to subscribe every month to somebody with your, um, prime subscription, right. at which, which is really valuable to a DJ. You know, if you build up enough of those that can pay your gas bill, you know, I know, no, it's so it's true. Huge. Yeah. And, um, you know, like something else I wanted to talk, well, <laughs> I don't know if this is even possible, but you know, like. This podcast is for BeatSource, obviously, but uh, and I use BeatSource. But I wonder if there will ever be a time, because BeatSource has everything legal, is there where they could, and I know nothing about this, I'm not saying this is happening, but like, could Amazon or one of these companies utilize a company like that, like BeatSource, where they have all the stuff legal and do some kind of deal? Um, because the cool thing to me with BeatSource and DJs using it is that it's a real DSP just like Spotify or Apple. So if somebody plays a full song off BeatSource or a certain amount of time, the artist gets paid from it, you know, rather than just if they DJ, you know, downloaded it from something and played it. So like you said, there's so many DJs doing it. Could you imagine if a hundred thousand DJs were all playing the song, it would build up for the artist, you know? And I wonder if that would, I don't know, encourage the labels and the artists and these companies to make it legal for the DJs to actually be playing these songs online. Totally. I mean, they've just got to all get in a room, right? The thing yeah. that, going back to Mixcloud, the thing that I can't quite get my head around is I know the people who founded Mixcloud. I've been down to the Mixcloud offices in London multiple times over the years. Right, And I cannot understand how if this team of people in London have managed to make live streaming legal, completely 100% legal for DJs, how, how a company like Amazon can't do it. So I'm hoping, and I right. imagine that Amazon and Twitch are having these conversations in the background and yeah. hopefully something happens. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful because DJs on Twitch, are, that, that's not going anywhere. That's here to stay. Right. Yeah. And I just love how it's connected everyone in such a crazy way, like you said, through the rating and just through getting to know each other. And I mean, I, I'll raid somebody in Osaka with like an amazing bar and all these records and it looks so cool. And now I'm like, you know, I kind of know who that person is. And if I go to Japan, I'm going to that bar in Osaka, you know, and I learned about it from Twitch from watching him DJ and pick his records. And um, it's just been such a great way to connect our community and uh help everything grow you know um do you have any other ideas like on the future of live streaming or how it's connecting us or the benefits of performing in this virtual space versus uh the real real life gigs well you know i think it's still early days um i wouldn't be surprised if we end up seeing um DJs being booked to play at like private parties through Twitch. Cause I remember yeah. when, when COVID first hit and DJs started playing on Twitch, what True. I would do is I would just Chromecast it from my phone to my TV and I've got my TV there and I've got a speaker plugged into my TV. So I would sit there and I'd have DJ Marky DJing in my living room 
with a speaker where I can hear the music properly. And me uh, it wouldn't surprise me if DJs start getting booked for birthday parties or whatever, and they just DJ through someone's telly just to that crowd of people. Um, yeah, I'm surprised I haven't seen more of that actually. Uh, maybe that's right. something that will start to happen. But I've also seen people getting really creative with DJing on Twitch and actually trying to build like a virtual club um, yeah. on Twitch. So there's a DJ in London called Volatile. Yep. And he's been killing it on Twitch, absolutely killing it. And he did an event where he hired out, um, I think it was a club, but it was a venue. And he had a screen in front of him where you could dial in and appear on the screen. And then he could talk to you like he'd be DJing and then he'd talk to people who were essentially in the club, but they were just at home on their laptops. So wow. that was awesome. So people have been, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's very much at the beginning. And I think that stuff will evolve because, you know, people, people love Twitch. Yeah, I agree. And the sky's the limit with it, you know, and, and we're also just at the beginning as the internet gets more powerful and as mobile and 5g and all this stuff comes into play. I mean, the creativity level might just be nuts. People are going to be in their Tesla, you know, doing a stream that's going to look just as high quality as some, anything else. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? So that's great. And yeah, Volatile, shout to him. I love his his channel. He does exactly what he wants musically. He knows how to set yeah. the vibe, talk to the crowd enough where it's really fun and you get to know him, but you get to know his music as well. And he's a great DJ and he comes up with these creative ideas. So I think that's a great example of, of what could be done, you know? Um, and then same yeah. with OBS. I mean, like this is the most insane program. You know, when someone told me, I'm like, how do I stream on Twitch? I, I have my phone and my thing. And they go, oh, you got to get OBS. I'm like, what the hell is that? And I start looking into it. I'm like, wow, like just a community of people building this program, the most futuristic thing ever. You know, you don't buy this, you don't buy it. At, there's just a community of people working on it because they love it. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I love that. <laughs> it's so cool. Uh, yeah, OBS, OBS has been, one of the biggest discoveries for me ever in music and the fact yeah. that it's free, you know, like a, a, an application that has that much power, you should be paying for that. The fact that it's free right. is remarkable and, and open source. It's incredible. It's um, amazing. And, and yeah, like zoom and OBS were the two major apps <laughs> of, of COVID of 2020. Oh yeah. So much. And I mean, they, they brought, let me perform, you know, I mean, I, I, um, I recorded pre-done sets in OBS and would send them in and did a New Year's gig and they broadcasted them. Or I did things on Zoom for my kid's school and I would DJ all of his school fundraisers and things like that through Zoom. I mean, it's unbelievable. Doing this podcast, you know, all this stuff. So um, thank God for technology and, you know, you just had to jump in and try to figure it out. And every day I'm still figuring it out. Uh, new things new cameras and new equipment but it's so cool so yeah i love you obs uh whoever <laughs> you are <laughs> all the people <laughs> making it happen um what are some of the things that that you think you've learned uh through the lockdown or having to be inside you know as a dj i know you work for serato and you have a job but also you're a true dj who's been out there doing it forever uh are there any things that you've taken away from having to change your schedule and be inside so much well i i learned a few new skills uh when when lockdown hit um so we've filmed videos at the, at the london studio plenty of them over the last three four years <clears throat> but we've always got someone in to shoot the video. So pers on a personal level, I, I learned how to shoot video and I got busy with cameras. And um, that was a that was a major new skill that I learned. Um, and again, going back to the live streaming stuff, a lot of my uh, previous 12 months has been taken up with getting DJs on board with streaming, helping them with that. Um, so yeah, I, I would I would say live streaming, again, has been a yeah. huge thing. Um, before we go on, I just wanted to quickly go back to something you mentioned before when we were speaking about Volatile. You mentioned that he has been playing music that he loves, like music that he's into. I think right. that out of out of streaming on Twitch in the past year, I think that has been the most 
important thing that's that's come out of it is all of these DJs have come out and started playing music that they love. And I'm sure you can relate to this. When you're out there DJing in clubs, that isn't necessarily always the case. You end up, you know, playing to the crowd that you're there to please, you know? Yeah, um, of course. And it's been incredible watching people just go out there and just go, you know what? I'm just going to play music that I love. And that's something that I tried to do when I was streaming on my own channel, um, going back to my roots and playing UK Garage and and hip hop and things like that. Yeah. So that's been great. I, I, I just love it when a DJ is there playing music that is clearly just for them because that's what right. Twitch should be about for me. It really I is. I agree. Yeah. And that's, it helps me get to know the DJ, their personality, where they come from. I'm like, I didn't know they were into that. Um, and you, you really get to know all the different factors. You know, some of them are, have been so into nineties hip hop. Some of them love some of the cheesy club music, which I didn't know, you know, like some, I come from where, okay, we got to play this kind of stuff because the people like it, but I don't necessarily like it. And then I'll see some DJs and I'm like, oh, they actually like that stuff. And no, no disrespect. I mean, that's good, but I, it's so interesting to, to learn everyone's personality and their taste through that. And I think that's really the place to do it. Um, it just goes back to, the beginnings of DJing and why we started DJing. You know, I just started DJing because I wanted to play mm -hmm. underground hip hop, drum and bass, funk music, doubles, show where a sample came from, things like that. I And then once I got into club world and getting paid, you realize, okay, you got to make people dance. It's a whole different thing. So that's, that's really a part of Twitch that people should lean into. I agree. hundred percent. And it, it has been amazing to watch certain DJs build a following based on them playing music that they love because, yes. I mean, how, how gratifying is that to build an audience who love what you play and it's what you truly want to play? So, like, DJ Marky from Brazil, who who's a drummer bass DJ, yeah. One of one of my favorite streamers of the past 12 months. Same. Obviously he's been he's been killing it with the drum and bass, but he also does quite a lot of um influences sets which yep. are just incredible. He actually started doing it on Instagram. Yeah. Um just through the through the microphone on his phone. Um and then I got in touch with him. I've been in touch with Marky for a while. He obviously uses Serato and we sent him a Roland Go mixer. So he plugged that into his phone and then he started to get real audio. Um, and then he moved on to Twitch and he's killing it on Twitch. Um, but yeah, like there's, there's countless examples of people who are, who are, are really getting their due for, for doing what they love. And again, volatile is one of them. Um, there's another guy who I want to shout out actually, who I think has been a real success story over in this country. And that's a guy called Ray Domingo. I don't know if you've seen any of his streams. Definitely. He's one of the people I, I was referring to when I said I heard them talking about, oh, this date, June 21st. Um, but he's great. I raided into him one night. I had a ton of people. It was the middle of the night and he was doing a morning set. And I was looking through and I'm like, you know what? I've never raided Ray before, but I watch him. So I raided into him. And I think I did a Boom Bap Mondays one time where we were both on the bill. Um, but he's great. He's someone that I had no idea who they were and got to know him um, along with a, a ton of other DJs. And Marky as well is someone that I've been a fan of forever. I mean, I have, of course, his most classic 12-inch, you know, record, his hit record, um, you know, with the guitar sample. I can't even remember what it's called right now. Um, LK. Yeah, LK. Yeah, the stamina. Yeah, it's like, I like it. You like it. So I, I huge fan of Marky, but seeing him through quarantine on Instagram and then over to Twitch, I watched his whole transition of all of it. And um, I would go ride my bike and just like listen to him DJ his influence set or a drum and bass set. And it was so inspirational and cool. And, uh, and just the fact that I could travel around the world. I would listen to a set from, you know, Zagon from Brazil. Then I'd head over to Marky in Brazil. Then I'd listen to DJ Nuts from Brazil. Then I'd go over to Jazzy Jeff, you know, in Philly. And then I'd be in LA listening to Melody. And, and it's like I'm on the world tour just on my bike, like riding around or back home, like you said, Chromecasting to my TV. I mean, it was kind of my dream come true. You know, it's like my own... Coachella or some festival that I get to go to and I want to see all the DJs, but I get to just change the channel and be so close to them and hear the perfect, uh, you know, fidelity, not have to wear earplugs and stuff. 
Yeah. And and Ray Domingo started at the very bottom and just organically has got himself to partner and amazing. He's he's absolutely killed it. There's there's another DJ, a girl in the UK called DJ Mia Moore, um, who's another great example of someone who just gave it a go and is doing nice. really well out of it. Okay, yeah. I need to check her out. I haven't seen her yet. And that's the thing. I'm constantly learning. Like I, every time there's a new raid or somebody talks about someone or I see on the discover thing below, I try to go to the streams you might like um, area because it's not the best, but I still find some people in there sometimes, you know, that I'll, that Definitely. I might like. <laughs> So, but yeah, Ray Domingo kills it. I love his music taste. I love his energy. I love everything he brings to the the table at, at, on Twitch. And the cool thing I think right now that we're about to see that we haven't seen yet is the comp the transition back into real life. So this Thursday, um, there's this um, girl Lonnie Love. She's on there. She's someone else that came on in the beginning in the beginning has been killing it she has a crew with a few other uh, women djs um, called club mesh and they've built up this big following and all this great stuff and this thursday they're doing a party in real life in la and i saw her posting about it like okay people they're gonna have name tags for all the twitch people to put their handle so you'll know who the hell you know this you know like loghead 503 you know all these weird names like um are and um but it, I, i'm so interested to see how this will work or i've seen people saying okay my subscribers can get into the club i'm djing free in whatever city and um you know i i'd love to see the the people from twitch come into real life and come to these either ticketed events or be able to come to the club events and have vip status because of their sub or something like that Dope. Yeah, I actually want to shout out my colleagues in New Zealand because they put on an event in Auckland called Live and Direct, and it was all streamed on Twitch. Um, I think it was like an eight-hour event, and they had, yeah. in the actual venue, they had screens on either side of the DJ booth that had the Twitch chat um, for everyone there to see. Um, yeah. And we're going to be doing more of those as well. Um, I think the plan is to actually try and do one in... Um, other territories so maybe do one in london maybe do one in la maybe new york right. but none of that's been confirmed yet but yeah like there's definitely going to be this mesh of both of those worlds and that sounds really cool the thing that you just mentioned yeah i think it's great everybody this is where the creativity can be taken to the next level and see how it can uh interact with real life stuff in the same way people are doing with the nfts and all that stuff you know okay you buy my nft and you have access to whatever it is you know steve aoki just came out with this whole insane plan where all the different levels and and tiers and the amount of nfts you own and blau and all these people doing it so you know in the same way where you're big subscribers and i mean i would love to go i love going to see four color zach dj normally but i'd love to go see him in a venue where he gets to just pull off exactly what he does on twitch to a crowd you know and then somehow we can be interactive rather than just the dancing normal old school way you know yeah absolutely I think there's a there's something to that and just being able to stream things and watch them like Red Bull three style and things like that, that that we used to watch, you know, other ways. It's cool now that we're all used to Twitch. There's there's ways to do it. And even Chris Villa, like he streams his gigs now, but then he also has like the people he was explaining it to me. It's confusing, but he'll have people at the gig asking what he's doing and then they'll subscribe to his Twitch channel live, but they're standing in front of him and he's like showing him how to do it. Um, so, you know, more, more income, more connection, a new way to get to know your audience. And uh, yeah, it's so cool. And speaking of events and live events and virtual events and all that stuff, um, I know that Serato and BeatSource are coming together to do a webinar series called What's Next. Uh, and they're yeah. talking about how DJs can leverage streaming into their own service line as well as current live streamers to expand their existing setup, revenue, like all that stuff. So basically, um, 
you know, you guys have come together to create these, I think, three webinars, um, one for the West Coast on June 23rd, one for the East Coast of the United States on June 30th, and then on July 7th for the UK with d a different group right. of five uh, speakers. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just, you know, trying to remember. That's all, that's at my all notes. spot on. <laughs> Um, okay, great. And so um, what what will that be like? You know, I have some of the information in front of me, but if you want to talk about it, I know you're a big part of that. So I think that's super exciting and something that once this episode comes out, uh, it will be available for DJs to sign up. And actually, let me let them know before you get into it. Uh, the link is link.beatsource.com slash what's dash next. So um, rewind that if you need to, but uh, go check that out and uh, we'll put the link in the description, I'm sure. Uh, and sign up is only a certain amount of RSVP spots. But um, yeah, what are some of the things that you think DJs will get out of this? What are you going to talk about? What is it even going to be like? So the webinar is to help DJs in this current covid world and also the post covid world because hopefully right. we're coming to the end of it now yes um, i hope so that remains to be seen i guess but um yeah this is a webinar to help djs expand their revenue streams um and how they can how they can take advantage of this new digital world so at each event, as you mentioned, the first one will be june twenty third on the west coast and at each of these events we're going to have one content creator that we speak with um and we're also going to have uh, a dj that we speak with somebody who has done well maybe on twitch um youtube things like that um so for the west coast i'm actually going to tell you who we have so for the west coast event this will be hosted by stars davis from b source um and my colleague cut corners matt perry um and for the West Coast, we're going to have Cleveland Terry, who's going to be talking about how he has done in, in lockdown and the new the new moves he's had to make to keep up with this world. Um, right. And we're going to have Bella Fiasco as well, who has been killing it on Twitch, amongst other yes. things. Um, now, for the East Coast, again, we'll have Stars Davis and my colleague who runs the New York studio, OP. And we'll have Nick Spinelli, um, who you're familiar with, I'm sure and yeah. jmkm who again has been killing it on twitch and then we'll have the uk event and that's going to be hosted by myself and mojax and we're going to have lily k who is a german dj who has been again killing it on twitch i highly recommend you go and check her out on twitch okay, and to. we're going to have uk uk dj andy purnell who has been yeah. creating a lot of content and been doing really well on tiktok as well and that's another thing that we're going to speak about tiktok is, be is becoming super important now if you're a content creator and you're a dj who is oh, active man. on social media don't ignore tiktok it's i know it's a thing. i know everybody likes to say oh it's for the kids i can't get on tiktok i'm like you are going to regret it in the same way that you were saying about instagram and you waited too long don't wait too long on tiktok like i've been on there yeah. and um like i was even telling you um before we started like I have record labels hit me up and, and publishing companies to try to have them help me find um, producers and DJs to do remixes. But the new thing I've been hit up for are to find DJs who are just doing blends and mashups on TikTok that they think can help them blow up. Yeah. So, yes. I understand there's some annoying things on TikTok to some DJs that are like, oh, this person's doing that. Or I used to do this or it's fake. But I would really take... The same way you jumped into Twitch and put your passion into it, I would do that on TikTok. Um, I know it, and it might feel weird at first, and I'm actually talking to myself in this. You know, I've been uh, doing TikTok for like a, a, while, a little while, but I haven't put as much energy into it, and um, I had like a couple videos go like viral. You know, all of a sudden, I was like, oh shit, I got a billion hits on this random one, you know, like... It was a four second video of a girl coming into the DJ booth and being annoying, you know, and I think that like somehow hit on TikTok. I think I've seen that. I think I've seen that. <laughs> so, you know, you never know what, but I think that, but I, what I do notice is if you go into your passion and your passion is mixing these songs together, it might hit on TikTok and it's something to put your time into. And it's something that labels, bookers and all types of people are going to be looking into whether you like it or not. So I would, um, 
yeah, I would put your time into that. And that's such a great group of guests, everybody you named. I will proudly say that most of them have been on this podcast, which is so cool. Um, so, Hi. yeah, Bella Fiasco, JM Cam, um, Cut Corners, uh, Cleveland Terry, everybody. Um, I have not – what was the um, – for the UK, you, you said her name was Lily K. Yeah, Lily Kay. Um, she okay. is German. She's currently based in New York. Um, she's she's great. We actually just had her do a takeover of our channel. Um, I think it was just nice. last week, actually. Um, Amazing. Yeah, she's brilliant. I highly recommend you go check okay, her out. I got to check her out. The, and um, yeah, Nick Spinelli, I know who he is, but he has not been on here yet. But uh, I think that would be a great person to come on. But most everyone yeah. else. Oh, and Andy Purnell. Yeah, he's great. He's like just makes you like feel happy because while you're watching him, I don't know why he has like this smile and he looks like he's having so yeah. much fun that you're just like, I'm having yeah. fun too, Andy, let's go. <laughs> 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 and he's a real champion for UK music as well. He's, he's big yes. on his grime and his drill. So yeah, we've got it. a great lineup. And also I should mention that um, on each of those events, the Serato representative on that call. So it'll be me for the UK, right. um, OP for the East coast and Matt for the West coast. We will be going through showing you how to live stream with Serato and OBS. So we'll show you everything that you need to do. And because we've put in a lot of, um, live streaming tools in Serato DJ pro. Now you can actually live stream and use Serato from the same laptop. So we'll be showing you how to do all of that. It, it couldn't be easier amazing i know i love that once you guys uh you know implemented the ability to share the audio with other things i didn't have to use loop back and all those extra things i had been i had learned over time you know the amount of different i rigs and things i have like on this side of my room is crazy <laughs> roland go mixers i rigs road podcasters and endless shit but now you don't even need it so it's so great i just do the share and just like i was trying to show my son you know i don't have it here but one of the hercules controllers or one of those little ones a new mark or something and i'm playing with it and then i remembered oh because i was like oh you need headphones so i was like oh, i pushed the button where it just came out of laptop speakers and i was able to teach him yeah. some little thing and then we could go to soccer practice so uh so much nicer you know to be able to even just show up and coming DJs or his friends at school that are like, Oh, you're a DJ. What do you do? Rather than going, okay, you got to come to my place and have it plugged in and all that stuff. So I love it. Yeah. That's another thing that we put into the software post post first lockdown. So, you know, when COVID first hit, that's one thing that I do love about Serato is that and working for a company like this is they are very happy to just put certain plans back a little bit to do the right. right thing now for the dj so putting in all of the live stream stuff that wasn't in the roadmap at all but they got it done and it's really helped a lot of people yeah one thing i guess selfishly and probably people listening uh i want to ask about that and if you have no answer totally understand but um when are when do you think is there any sort of roadmap or timeline for the revamp of the library like the music library and the ability to um my personal number one top thing that would help me so much is the ability to search crates um i've been djing on Toronto i knew you were gonna say since that the beginning i mean since two, i've been on since 2005 i want to say or maybe 2006 or five since the beginning and I still have a lot of the crates and um i know i can hack it and go in the back and search through my things and find it but if I were able to just easily search for a crate the same way I can search for a song, it would change my life. <laughs> it would be so great. Um, and I just wonder, I know it has something to do with the system Serato was built on and it's, it's way easier said than done to just go add this feature because they have to revamp it all. But is there any, um, an OP one was on here and said that's being worked on, but I didn't know how much that's being pushed forward <laughs> or if that's a priority. <laughs> So this is an, an awkward moment because I don't know how much I can tell you. Okay, that's fine. Totally fine. Um, but what I will say, so did you say you had OP on and he mentioned something? <laughs> he did mention that um, they know about that. They have a huge plan to revamp the library and make it wonderful and take into all of the things 
that everybody has suggested and that they all understand all of the things that we're talking about. I think it was very vague and that was a paraphrase of what he said, sort of. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. So this was quite a long time ago now. So we're talking about 18 months ago. I went out to Auckland. We normally go out there once a year, all of the AR team to sort of see everyone at HQ. Yeah. And we had a long conversation about the library with the products team and the executive team, actually. And it's something we're well aware of. It's something that we want to do. And it's something that there are plans to do. Um, I cannot give you a date for many reasons. Number one, I, I, I'm not allowed to. But number two, because of COVID, certain things have been pushed back. But what right. I will say is it's, it's definitely something we're aware of. And it's something that is being worked on. I can definitely say that, but right. That's I can't say know. anymore. Okay. Yeah. It would be cool to even have like a standalone separate library only uh, program in the same way you guys created Serato sample and studio, even if it wasn't even built into the actual program, just something that could be built that could then sync up with it and help organize. Like even the ability to just um, grab 20 crates and move them somewhere instead of having to go click one move d d d d d you know it's like the most um yep. old school way of doing things it feels like a lot of the stuff you know yeah totally well another thing i can say is um <clears throat> i won't go into too much detail here because it is a little bit and you may have it's a little bit boring and you may have heard it before but the the code that is written for the library in serato is very 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 old right and the reason that nothing can change with the library in its current state is because if from what I've from what I understand, if you were to change some of the library code as it is today, it would break other things in the software and it's too yeah. too tricky to do. But of course. if and when a new library does come along, it will be built in a way where we can add to it whenever we, you know, want to. And depending on what people want, we can then add certain features so that is that's a huge positive and like i said it's 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 something they're aware of and something that work is being done on so that's as much as i can say i'm afraid yeah. it's it's okay that's fine that's fine we we know that it's <laughs> not being ignored <laughs> um i know people will want to hear that and i just wanted to ask myself to see if there was any sort of oh well we got this come in at this point um but that that helps um all right well let's get into uh, your history, you know, you have such an interesting history in the DJ world. And I feel like you are um, a person who has had many chapters in their DJ book. And I think it would be very interesting for DJs to hear your journey, how it started and how it started through the pure love of the art of DJing, the music you were into, scratching and just doing it completely for no other reason but the love of it um and then where it has led you you know so um where how did you first start out and who were some of your influences when you first began so um i started a long time ago so i started when i was about 11 or 12 i'm 35 now 36 okay. next week actually um and nice. i started by my my brother and some of his friends they all chipped in some money to buy a set of decks. Uh, you know, not not a great set of decks, but back in those days, that's what you did when you were that old. If you loved music, that's what you did because it was all on vinyl. And I'm, um, you know, it's 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 hard to not sound like an old man when you talk about <laughs> <laughs> the mid nineties. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it all started from that. They got these turntables and I went round there one day. I'd always been into music even before that. And I went round there one day and I was just kind of fascinated by it. And because I was the young younger brother, I wasn't really allowed to use them that much. But from that moment, I became pretty obsessed with it. Um, I can't remember exactly how old I was when that happened, but I think I was about 11. And I... I was into garage music back then. At this point, I wasn't interested in the whole turntablism thing. I was just into garage and used to listen to pirate radio every day because that's what everybody did then. You would listen to pirate radio, you'd go into school the next day and everyone had listened to the same thing. Nice. Um, and 
it all started from there and I just became more and more obsessed with it. I started to build a small record collection because I, I was, I was too young to like go out and buy records every single week, but I started to build a record collection and I managed to convince my mum to buy me a very cheap new Mark DJ in a box type thing, which right. was like two, two belt drive turntables, a mixer, needles, headphones, and speakers. And it was incredibly cheap. It was like even, so this would have been about 1997. This would have cost about 200 pounds, um, which was really cheap. And and right. no, not throwing any shade at Newmark, but it felt cheap. You know, <laughs> every part of it felt very, very budget. But yes. having said that, I I spent so much time on these turntables that I, I I kind of learned how to control them, even though they were turntables that if you just pushed them a tiny bit, they just went and went and went. So you have to have a really <laughs> delicate touch. And I yes. just, that's, that's how I learned. And I'm really glad I did because whenever I then use Technics turntables, because I, I, I had a few friends who were who whose parents were quite rich and they had Technics turntables. So I would go around their house and I just couldn't believe that they had these decks and it was just like my dream to have 1200s. Right. Um, <laughs> Amazing. <clears throat> and yeah, I basically learned on belt drives and got to a point where I managed to get one 1200 and can't actually remember how old I was at that point. I think I would have been 13 or 14 because when I was 15, about to turn 16, I entered my first DMC competition. Um, so I must have got that first 1200 around 14 years old because I got one 1200, which I learned to just scratch on because I had to get rid of all of my setup to get this 1200. So I had the Newmark blue mixer and one 1200 and then couldn't mix so i just learned to like transform and and chirp and and do do certain scratches um i must mention as well i almost forgot to mention that um i just randomly happened to buy a magazine one day a uh, shop and it was a yeah. magazine called seven and this yeah. magazine was run by dmc right and it came with a vhs and the vhs was kind of like a compilation tape of um of dmc highlights from over the years and that buying that was the thing that really really got me into into scratching and turntablism and i became really obsessed with dmc videos from that point so i just there was a record store in kingston in southwest london called beggars banquet records and they used to stock all of the dmc videos and that's how i got into it and i just became utterly obsessed with it utterly obsessed i did nothing else with my time well, that's great. That's what leads to greatness a lot of the time. And the, I mean, same, we were obsessed with these videos back in the day, like any one we could get, you know, VHS and we would watch from Huber to, you know, DJ Swamp lighting his records on fire to like every crazy thing. You're like, what are they doing? This is mind blowing. Mixmaster Mike and Rob Swift and executioners and you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And I used to go to every ITF battle in the Bay area and, um, you know, whatever was happening. Um, <clears throat> and I know that, um, you know, someone else that we had on the show, uh, UK DJ, DJ complexion. Um, we had, you have some sort of connection with him through scratching as well. I know he's a dope scratch DJ. Now he has his amazing future beats show. Actually, my phone just popped up and said uh, on Twitch that he just went live doing his future beats show, which um, is kind of how I met him. I would, I tuned into this show and I'm like, who is this guy? He seems super cool. I love everything he talks about and his, his um, ideas and then the music he's playing is so dope you know and so we just kind of became friends like that he came on the show and I just you know we had like uh, similar mental states I guess I don't know you know I just felt like we connected in that way so what's your connection with him so Complexion's a really good guy so we're actually from roughly the same area in southwest London oh, and wow. before I had 1200 turntables this was when i still had the belt drives there was a youth club in the town that i'm from called heatham house and they used to have a flight a big flight case that had two 1200s and a mixer 
which is just incredible because it, it meant that I could go and regularly, regularly practice on 1200s. And I was a garage DJ back then. I wasn't really playing hip hop or even really into hip hop at that point, to be honest. I was right. just into garage and a little bit of drum and bass. Um, yeah. So me and my friends would go down there and we would take turns to like mix and play garage records. One day, Complexion, who I think he's only a, a couple of years older than me, came right. down, but he seemed so much older. Um, <laughs> yeah. And he was the first DJ that I'd ever saw cutting up a record. I'd seen oh, it wow. on video at that point, but I'd never seen anyone do it before. And he, um, I'm pretty sure he was cutting up the acapella from Simon Says. I'm pretty sure. Um, and that was the first time I ever saw it live. And like, if you were to ask pretty much any scratch DJ why they got into it, they'd usually say, I saw someone do it and it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, you know? Yeah. Totally. And that's after seeing it on the videos, it was really cool. But then seeing someone do it live, it was just, like I said, I got utterly obsessed with it. And me and Complexion have been friends ever since. And actually, yeah, Complexion's going to be on, he's going to be on the podcast uns Unscripted with Cut Corners soon. I don't oh, know the great. exact date yet, but Complexion will be on the Serato channel doing the podcast with Cut Corners. So keep an eye out for that. Nice. He's so great. I mean, he, he just has such an optimistic, positive outlook on just other human beings and life and, and his sayings that he says and next week, best week. And, uh, you know, I just got mad love for him. So that's so cool that, you know, you such an amazing award-winning scratch battle DJ, uh, heard him cutting for the first time is such a crazy connection. I love that. Yeah. And also like he's killing it right now. He just got a yep. radio show on BBC one extra doing, um, the future wave mix. So obviously he's yeah. got the future beat show. And he's now doing a show called The Future Wave Mix on BBC Sounds. So check that out as well. It's well-deserved. I'm so happy for him. Um, he puts in so much work. And, you know, I've seen his channel grow on Twitch. And the amount of uh, work he's put in on Twitch has just been great. Um, that's yeah. So cool. and, and even yeah. before Twitch, like, Complexion was one of... Like, oh, yeah. He started doing The Future Beat show. And... That was, I mean, that's been going for years oh, yeah. now. It's, it's huge and on SoundCloud for sure. Like, I'm, yeah. uh, I was just saying from Twitch, from me seeing him, but yes, I mean, he's been putting in work forever like that. Yeah. Yeah. And he was one of the first people that I'd seen start a thing that is from the heart. It's like, no, I just want to yes. do a thing where I play music that I love and it's, it's, it's took off and it's great to see. Yeah, that's why Twitch was actually perfect for him to come into because he's like, I've been doing this. I created this whole thing, uh, you know, on radio and on SoundCloud and created this massive SoundCloud following. So for him to dive right into it with Twitch and bring them in was really cool to see. Yeah, he's already built his community. Yeah. And so, so, so you got into it like that. And then what inspired you to then enter the battles because you won – you know, you've won many DMC battles. Um, you know, you've got some legendary routines that people can check out on YouTube. Um, particularly, I think uh, the 2004 DMC routine is that one of your your most yeah. proud of ones. That was the main one. Yeah, that was the that was winning the UK DMCs in 2004. Um, I'd Amazing. actually entered the DMCs for the first time in 2001 when I was still 15. Um, mm -hmm. And didn't didn't do didn't do great, but I did okay. So at, at a DMC event back then, you would right. You were for 15, every heat though, for I mean, every <laughs> that's yeah. like A track <laughs> level. A track won the worlds though. He was a lot better than me at fifteen. I mean, I remember, and I was like, "Who is this child? Like, this is unbelievable." Like, that was just crazy to see that he, you know, he was just child prodigy, amazing. He still is, obviously, but. Um, that's so cool. Okay, so you entered when you were 15. You didn't win, but you still did pretty good, which is commendable right there. Yeah, so I got to the the final of the of the London heat. So basically yeah. back then, every city, they would maybe do like eight heats around the country, and anybody could enter the heat, and you would get three minutes during the daytime to impress the judges, and then they would put 10 uh, competitors through to the final of that heat and I got through to the final of that heat which was which was not expected at all um, right. 
and I was because I was still 15 they had to actually like hide me in a back room in the venue because I wasn't <laughs> meant to be there oh my god I've seen that in Vegas like I remember they'd be booking Martin Garrix and all these people and they're like he's not allowed to be in the casino but he's getting paid so much money to play at the club so they'd be like <laughs> They'd have to sit in the hotel room and then the security would have to get him and get him right to the club, to the booth. He'd have to perform and then just leave. You know, anyone, because there was a bunch of underage people that would have a huge hit EDM song, but they were, you know, 19 or something. So I've seen that. That's, yeah. that's so funny. You had to hide <laughs> going in there and you're yeah. competing against these people. Unbelievable. Yeah. So I was, I was really spurred on by that because I got further than I thought I would. So yeah. that was that would have been that would have been like May two thousand one, and then I entered the DMCs every year. Um, did okay in two thousand two. I actually got to the UK final in two thousand two, and wow. even that was like, you know, like a dream come true to just yeah. be in the UK final, That's and huge. not something that I expected. It, but it happened, and I, I did okay. I think I, I could be wrong here, but I think I came fifth in that UK final, which is which I wasn't expecting. And then I started at that point, I started to realize I, I could really put time into this and maybe do okay. So that was when I really knuckled down and really took it seriously and basically practiced nine hours a day, you know, wow. doing a level of practice that didn't feel like that because I was genuinely doing it because I wanted to. So right. it's, it's, it's funny because it's only in hindsight that I realized how great it was to have a thing that you were so obsessed with that time just goes by. So yeah. it's not, back then it's not as if I was like saying to myself, right, you have to practice nine hours a day. I just did it because I really, really loved doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so then 2003, I came second in the UK final. Um, and then, and then I was like, right, next year I've got to take this and then put everything into it. And then fortunately won the 2004 UK DMC final and then went on to the world final and came fourth, which is I'm, I'm considering the DJs who came above me in the world final. I'm very proud of that. That's amazing. That's so that's huge. And it's so fun to watch your routine on there. Um, you, I mean, you do some really creative, crazy stuff, like taking apart the turntable and turning it upside down and taking off the stylus and, Take it, you know, and also, you know, you tap into your love in the same way we keep talking about um, Twitch and everything. I think you ended your set with um, a gar garage uh, song, right? Uh, and then recreated like the bass using that crazy sound. So you were doing something like you said that you were passionate about and that you love. And I think that's what shown that's what showed through, and you won. So that that says a lot about it. Yeah, it was. Um I so th this trick that I ended the set with, I still don't quite understand it. To be honest, <laughs> all I know is that if you use a twelve hundred or a twelve ten turntable with a Shaw M four four seven needle and cartridge, right. if you take the stylus off the cartridge, that's important. You take the stylus off the cartridge, right. and then you take the platter off the turntable, and then you take the little um, seven inch adapter and you put that on the spindle, and then you put the platter back on upside down, if you then manually spin it and you put yeah. the cartridge onto the magnet, it creates the most insane bass <laughs> wobbly sound. Depending on, how fast, depending on how fast you spun the platter, the wobble right. will get faster. I still don't understand it. I don't even <laughs> remember how I came up with it, to be honest. Um, all I know is that it worked. And I remember, I do remember the moment where it happened and I was like, this is crazy. There has That's to be something in this that because yeah, dubstep as well that. in the UK, right. like the, the early dubstep was just becoming a thing and grime as well. So the fact that it created such a kind of dark wobbly baseline sound just felt so apt at that time as well. It was, it was a very happy accident. Right. That's so cool. Um, well, it was, yeah, I'm glad you discovered it and figured, and now you don't know how you did it, but, uh, so cool to watch and listen to, you know, later. Um, I, so I, then go I keep saying to myself, yeah. sorry, I keep saying no, to no, myself go, one please. day I'm going to do, 
I keep saying I'm going to do a YouTube video where I kind of try and break it down and then try and work out what's actually happening because I've never done that. I've never really dug into what's creating that sound because something's right. going on there because there's no stylus. So there's no, it's it not was also just impressive. Uh, like how quickly you took off the platter. <laughs> Surprised me. Do you know what? You that like was, banged that on it. I was like, what's he doing? You're like, boom, bap. Psh. I'm like, okay, wait, does yeah. he have it loose? How did he do that so fast? So I learned after many attempts that all you need to do is, you know, you know how the platter has like a couple of holes in it. Yeah. All you, you need to do, your fingers in? you just, you just hook your finger in one of those holes and then you just need to get something heavy and bang the spindle and it will pop off. That's all you need That's to do. so funny. I watched you do it in the video and I'd rewound. I'm like, what is he doing? And you're like, boom, bap. I'm like, oh, what is, he has some. Hat, Let me tell you, you a know? funny story about that actually. Um, <laughs> So the tool that I used to get the platter off was just a big, heavy screwdriver like with a big, fat end. Okay. Um, and I used to carry it around in my DJ bag in case I ever needed to get the platter off. They're like, he's going to kill then, the other DJs. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, not very long after that UK DMC final, in fact, no, yeah. not long after the world final, I got a flight somewhere and no. I forgot to take it out of my out of my bag. <laughs> so I actually I actually went through the X rays where you go through to your gate, and they found it right. and they took it off me. So that's long gone. Oh my god! How many DJs are searched like they think that we got bombs and they've opened my that blue case, you know, with the needles, and they're like, "What is this?" I'm like, "Needles." They're like, "Needles." I'm like, "Yeah, for like turntables, you know." How many? They always like, oh, "What are all these wires?" And DJs are the most <laughs> false setting off the security thing you know you're like i'm using that to take off the platter of a turntable but like i mean I don't know what you're do you know what about. i didn't i didn't even try and explain it because no, i just I let mean, them take it as if it's yeah. gonna work so i was like yeah take it right. but it was it, it must have been must have belonged to my dad i just found it around the house <laughs> big <laughs> screwdriver and it was perfect and i just had it in my back pocket in the dmc set and then Bang, wow. So if you ever need to get a platter off a 1210, just hold the platter up slightly, bang the middle, and it will pop off immediately. That is so funny. Oh, my God. Go look in your dad's toolbox, and then you'll be able to pop it off. I don't know if you can do that to the CDJ, though. That might not work as good, but you can <laughs> pop that sucker off, and you're never using it again. Um, so going from the battles and all that stuff, you've had so many different um, – you know, chapters in your career, like I mentioned. Um, and you, I know from there, did you go to being on the radio from being a battle DJ? Yeah. So I ended up doing a radio show on BBC One Extra um, almost immediately, actually, off the back <clears throat> of winning the UK DMCs. Um, oh, cool. The D winning, winning the DMCs was pretty much the only time in my career where I've where I've seen an opportunity and sort of laser lasered towards it. And like, I yeah. need to do that. Whereas everything else that's happened after that has been an opportunity that's just kind of come along organically. Yeah. Um, and that's what happened with one extra. I remember meeting some producers from one extra actually at the UK final event after I'd won. Mm -hmm. Um, and they stayed in touch Oh, cool! and they eventually, they asked me to come down and do a pilot. Um, I guess just to see if I could speak on radio and DJ on radio. So I went down and then right. they offered me, <clears throat> they offered me a slot initially on a show called extra talent, mm -hmm. which, which was where they got an up and coming DJ to just do a set like three till five in the morning once a week. So I did that. I think I must've done that four, maybe four times. I think I did it for a month and then the, the schedule, the schedule one extra changes every September, I believe. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but it was back then. Right. So September rolled around and they switched up the schedule and they introduced um, mix shows every nighttime. So like Monday would be the hip hop mix show, Tuesday R&B, Wednesday UK Garage, Thursday drum and bass, Friday dance hall. And they asked me to do the hip hop mix show uh, every other week in rotation with another DJ. So I did that and I did that for a year. Um, and that went well. It was, it very much suited my style because I was able to just mix and speak a little bit, but mainly just mix and just, you know, play a mixture of hip hop throughout the night. And that was great. Right. And then 
after I did that for 12 months, they offered me my own specialist show where I did, um, I played like kind of quite underground hip hop. It was kind of across the board, but it, it, I wasn't there playing, you know, the big club joints at the time. That wasn't what the show was about. Right. So I did that for two years. And then in 2007, they had a huge um, upheaval of the schedule where they, they, they got rid of quite a lot of DJs, and bought a lot of new DJs in. And that's when I stopped uh, DJ and one extra. Um, but it was a good experience. It was, again, it was something that I didn't expect to come along and it did. And I learned a lot from it. I learned a lot about myself. I was still very young as well. Like right. when I ended the one extra thing, I had just turned 22. So it all happened when I was very young. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And I, I did, I also did a one month residency on BBC radio one during my time there and BBC radio one, at the time and still is but certainly at the time it was the biggest radio station in the country yeah, it was the one huge. where before dab radio this is when you could get in your car and radio one was the station that you could easily tune into there was no interference all around the country so it was the biggest station that's when westwood was on radio one he was right. he was huge um so yeah good good times strange times because i was so young but good times Right. I know. I'm so jealous of that, that you guys have that, you know, BBC one, BBC one extra, like such a, you know, forward thinking, um, music station, you know, to have for the country and to, for the people, anyone to be able to listen to, you know, I feel like out here, it's always yeah. been very specialized and we didn't even have the pirate radio that you guys had. And I remember going to London for my first time and hearing pirate radio and having some weird little radio and having to adjust the, um, you know, antenna in a weird way and just getting it somewhat, yeah. you know, but hearing it and hearing these sounds and these types of music for my first time ever, not even understanding, what it is or if the dj was making the sound or if they, or they were playing a song or, you know what was happening i think that's such a great thing that you guys had over there um and pirate radio in a way connects to twitch and what we're doing now you know you get your own public access type of station you know to just bring to it what you want but that's such a great thing that that england you know the uk has uh, that they care about music and culture and arts in that way i think Totally. I mean, pirate radio was so fundamental to so yeah. much of the music that's come out of this country. You know, it's, it was right. huge. huge. Um, and that kind of radio does still exist, but it doesn't have, it's all on the internet. And right. what you just said about like the antenna, I have so many memories of like trying to tune into DJ EZ on a Sunday night and that he was on a station called Freak FM, which was on yeah. the other side of London. So for me to even remotely get the reception, I would have to buy, I remember buying this um, antenna that was just a wire. So you could, I'd put it in the back of the stereo and you'd sort of like trail it all around the wall and you'd find yes. a little spot oh on the ceiling God. up there yes. where you I would about sell that. I used to have one of those. Yes. <laughs> And you'd find this one spot, like if you moved it there, it was crackly. If you moved it there, it was crackly. It's just there. You could get it. I don't know why. I wonder what the science is behind that, why it's good just there in the corner know, of the room. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. Yeah, we had the, I mean, I remember being out there and having to do it. And then here just being far away, like I moved up uh, about an hour from the Bay Area, like when I was about 19 and I would try to listen to DJ revolution or this guy, Kevy Kev or people on the wake up show. And it was coming out of San Francisco. So I had to do the same thing. I'd have to get a boom box and bend the thing and then add that extra long wire thing and try and I'd record it too and have these horrible staticky recordings. But that was my only way to hear what was going on and be in touch with the music I liked and the people that I wanted, you know, trusted their, their opinions on the music. Yeah. I actually found a lot of, old DJ EZ Freak FM sets on YouTube recently. And that was, oh, wow. I mean, that took me back to being yes. like 12, 13. Um, and the energy that pirate radio had back then, it was crazy. It was right. It was awesome. Good time. Yeah, I agree. And so, so from there, um, you know, you've done so many different things. Was there ever a time, you know, um, that you felt kind of lost as a DJ and trying to find your next steps and where to go. Um, I don't know once you, 
you know, what the gap was from doing radio to what you did now, what you're doing with Serato. But um, yeah, can you speak about that? Maybe feeling lost and finding your next steps as a DJ and bouncing from thing to thing. Yeah, I mean, if I'm if I'm being completely open and completely honest, so I so I won the won the UK DMCs when I was 19, and then I started the role at Serato in 2017. So I would have been 32. Okay. If I'm being completely honest, on some level between that whole period, I was I I, I felt lost in some in, in some way throughout the whole thing because purely because I'd gone from having this laser focus on winning the DMCs. And then as soon as that happened, I kind of didn't have that laser focus for anything. Right. Um, I did some other things in that time. So I I worked on a video game called DJ hero, which ended up being um, like a full-time job basically. Yeah. Oh my God. I remember that. I mean, I was really close with DJ AM. So I remember just hearing about all of it, you know, and seeing it and going to the party they had for it here and stuff. Yeah. So you worked so there, there was, for years, right? You were that was like your full time gig for a few years at DJ Hero Activision. Yeah, that's crazy. exactly right. I actually think it ended up being four years, which is wow. crazy. Um, I worked on it from I worked on it from when it was just an idea of this guy called Daniel Neal, who now works for Activision in San Francisco. Okay. So Daniel Neal had the idea for DJ Hero. It was it was is kind of a off DJ? the back of the success no no okay he's not he's um he he his history is in video games um so he had the idea and it was at a time when guitar hero was a phenomenon i mean do you remember how big that game was it was huge especially in america it was big here but i remember reading about how big it was in america and it was it was crazy so it was around that time and daniel neal had the idea for dj hero and this is an example of how something can just come along completely and you just don't expect it at all. So he started working with a producer here in the UK called Dan, Daniel Pepe and Daniel Pepe um, needed to get a scratch DJ to work on this very early idea for DJ hero. And he actually got in touch with a guy called Tony Vegas from the scratch perverts because he knew him from back in the day. Um, Tony, Tony couldn't do it because he was too busy. Okay. So he put them in touch with me. And I, I I remember going down to a music studio. Can't even remember where it was in London, but I went down there and they asked me to bring a turntable and a mixer. So I took a turntable and a mixer down there and I met Dan and he explained to me that he's got this idea for a, for a DJ video game and he wanted it to he wanted he he already knew at that point that he wanted to sell it to Activision and he wanted it to become DJ Hero. But it was nothing more than an idea in Dan's head at that point. Um, wow. So I went down there and I recorded some scratches. And that that was the last I heard of it for about six months. Um, funnily enough, Dan um, Dan didn't pay me for, for, for about six months. And I remember he sent me an email after about six months and he said, look, I'm, I'm really sorry that I haven't paid you yet, but I've got some good news. I've been speaking to a video games company in the Midlands in the UK. I think it was in Leamington Spa. And they have decided to make essentially a pilot game of DJ Hero. So Activision weren't involved at this point, but he got a video game company to come on board and invest in making a sort of early playable version of what became DJ Hero. And he said, and I I wanted to know if you can come down to the studio that we're going to get in East London and work on it. So (laughs) it went from being like, why hasn't this guy paid me to cool? I've just got a job out of this. Let's, (laughs) let's go. Amazing. Um, So I started working at this studio in East London and then they made an early version of the game showed it to Activision, Activision bought bought the IP. They ended up buying the um, video game developer studio in Leamington Spa and they made DJ wow. Hero and Activision put so much money into that game. Um, and sales wise, it actually didn't do too bad. I think they sold a million of DJ Hero 1, which sounds good, but Activision were hoping for a lot more and it oh, okay. coincided it, we also ended up doing DJ Hero 2, and it was great fun. But yeah. it also, unfortunately, coincided with that whole peripheral-based music game 
industry kind of collapsing, probably because of oversaturation. There was rock bands, there was DJ Hero, there was Guitar Hero. And, you know, people probably just got bored of having, you know, using plastic toys for music games. But really glad it happened. Crazy time. And I, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to refer to it as a job because it wasn't really, you know. <laughs> That's great. I mean, to have something that you that you don't feel like it was a job for four years and you got paid from, that's really cool. Yeah, it was great. We um, we did quite a lot of, um, I did quite a lot of marketing around the world. So I went to Australia. I also came to San Francisco twice to do some DJ Hero launch events. They were pretty cool. I remember the second one for DJ Hero 2, we had Cuba there. We had DJ Shadow. Um yeah, it was it was pretty cool. Activision threw so much money at that thing; it was wow. absolutely insane. That's amazing. That also shows that you could throw all the money in the world at something, and if it's not going to succeed, it's not going to succeed. <laughs> if it's not meant to be, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm very proud to say that critically, the game was received very well. It was just yeah, it just coincided with a time that you know people lost interest in that genre unfortunately and maybe maybe it will happen again maybe there'll be another dj game that that some company comes along and maybe activision will try it again who knows well i mean like with the advent of tiktok and the reels on instagram and these mashup djs getting so big it might be something to the effect of that you know with the buttons and putting it together and I got this game for my son a couple of years ago called Drop Mix, and it was kind of dope. Like you put your iPad in the front of it, and then it has this whole system that you that is connected, and all these cards, almost like Pokemon cards, but they they represent a song. So it's like one is like Tribe Called Quest, check the rhyme or a scenario, let's say, and then another one's like, I mean, this sounds horrible, but like. Carly Rae Jepsen, Call Me Maybe. And then another one's like Katy Perry. And then another one, you know, is Eric B and Rakim. But you put them down. There's all these spaces. And as you put them down, the game keeps mashing them up and changing the tempos and doing all this stuff. And so you play each other, creating these things. I don't even know how it works. It's super dope. Like, and it just, it knows the code on the card. I don't know if it's reading the QR code. And through AI, it can like, remix the songs and we're creating these crazy four layer remixes and uh it, it gets him that's into cool. that sounds great it's super cool and that's years ago so who knows maybe there will be a new you know that's that's what uh the new thing could be in a way because i feel like kids now understand all the genres they hear the music of their parents they're in spotify beat source all these things playlisting things where you can hear many genres many years many eras and then they're finding ways to put them together now on tiktok so that could be the video game in a way you know the advanced version that sounds really cool i haven't actually heard of that what's it called again i feel like it maybe went out of business but it was called drop mix um and okay. i still it have it. that sounds really cool yeah it's a good it's it was the coolest thing i've ever seen but i've never i have my one friend in Atlanta has it and then no one else has ever, I've never seen it before. <laughs> um, but it's interesting yeah. because DJ hero was based around mashups, but it didn't work like that. DJ right. hero was based around mashups, but the mashup was the mashup. You couldn't interact. Right. Well, you could interact with it, but you couldn't change it in any way. It was yeah. what it was. No, this changes. It transitions the tempo. You pop down the Bruno Mars treasure card and all of a sudden it starts ramping up to 118, but then it's still playing the acapella of check the rhyme. And then it somehow can like do all this crazy stuff. So I wonder if someone put that into a video game, if people would even like That's cool. it, but seems, you know, good idea. Who knows? Um, so, and also I, I'm noticing that you somehow have this, um, running through line, uh, through all of the things you get brought into of people named Daniel, uh, because you had Daniel, <laughs> the composer, Daniel, the video game editor, and now you have Daniel, uh, you worked on spider verse and the composer of that is Daniel Pemberton, right? That was a great link, by the way. That was so, brilliant. I think anybody that you meet named Daniel, you should really take an extra five minutes to get to know them because they might be changing your life <laughs> every single time you meet them. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I, I was saying I watched, um, you know, the Welcome to the Spider-Verse, the Spider-Man movie, and I noticed 
immediately that the composed music well first of all i noticed cool music okay the uncle's listening to notorious big all of a sudden i'm very old because i'm like the uncle's age am i the uncle's age that's a song i listen to you know the little kids like oh what's this old school music i'm like no this is my music but besides that then i notice the the composed music is being scratched together and going with the movements of the characters and even the animation and like i think my mind actually exploded like it was so crazy to me and then i I told my son and my wife i'm like do you notice they're scratching and so then i watched the whole movie and i'm like i gotta watch it again because now i need to really examine what they're doing but i looked at the credits and thank god they put your name in the credits right they did and they did yeah Thank that's so cool. You know, good job guys putting his name in the credits because I think a lot of times you wouldn't have been in there or people don't get credit. You see even on EDM songs that people like, they don't know who's singing it. So they might've just taken your name right off of it. So I think that was cool. And you know, whoever decided to do that, but it it let me then look up, Oh shit, that was Blakey. That's nuts. So I, then that led me to find a podcast with Daniel Pemberton, listen to how it all came about. So interesting to me because I love music, uh, combined with movies and television shows. I wanted to be a music supervisor, you know, in my early twenties, that was what I thought my job would be. And then as my DJing took off, I was like, Oh, I don't have to wake up in the morning. I can go travel around and DJ. I'll do this for a while. You know, maybe something I'll go back to eventually, but that was such an amazing combination of all of it. So, um, I just always wanted to talk to you about that and wondered how that came about, what the process was like, how was it done? You know, how much you were into it and, and what Daniel Pemberton's vision for that was. Um, so anything you want to talk about in regards to that, that would be great. Well, that came around very randomly, to be honest. So I remember Daniel Pemberton um, got in touch with the support team at Serato uh, because he wanted to know if it was possible to scratch 5.1 surround sound audio files in Serato. Amazing. Um, so we got chatting through that. Um, <clears throat> and then he he asked to speak to me on the phone. So I called him up and he explained to me who he was, what he's done, and and this new movie, Into the Spider-Verse. Um, and he told me about his vision for the movie soundtrack and how he really wanted to include scratching in it, but in a in a kind of in a deep intertwined way that was really part of the soundtrack. Um, I'm actually saying soundtrack. I mean the score, the score right, of the, the movie. The score of the movie, yes. Yeah. Um, so then he came down to the studio. Um, the Serato studio in East London. And we, we, we just got on really well. We, he was telling me about what he wanted to put into the score. And I, I showed him some basic scratches at this point. I was still um, going to maybe put him in touch with another DJ because, you know, I didn't know what, what style of DJ he wanted, but I started yeah. doing some scratches and he was like, he was like, this kind of thing is just right. Um, do you mind if we record some of this? So we recorded some, he took it away and he, he put some of it into the kind of um, draft of the score. And after a couple of months when he had actually worked out exactly which parts he, he wanted scratched, um, he, he then invited me to the, the orchestral recordings of the music in the movie that he made. And that was kind of crazy because yeah. I've never been to anything like that. It was so cool. a room, a room that kind of looked like a church. I think, it, I think it may actually have been a church, a room of like 50 people with string instruments recording these. It, it was quite funny because obviously I've never heard this music before because it had been, it had been written by Daniel, but it felt Hollywood, the music, you know, it yeah. felt big and like, um, like the climax of a big part of a movie. It felt like that. Wow. Um, I've actually still got those recordings on my phone. Um, cause now that the movie's out, that music to people, people will know it really well and it will have this yeah. like real emotional attachment for people. So maybe I'll put those videos out at some point if Daniel will let me, I'm sure he will. Um, yeah. but anyway, after that, after they recorded the orchestral pieces, he then gave me, um, those pieces of audio to scratch. Um, 
and I went down to Abbey Road Studios, which is like a very famous recording studio in London. Yes, of course. Um, and we were in a room there, and he had a little. This this was very close actually to the release of the movie. This would this would have been like two months before the release. So, oh wow! I I imagine to get the scratching. Uh, recorded in the way he wanted, he kind of needed to have the movie and the score finished so that he could know exactly what sounds he wanted scratched and what parts of the movie he wanted them in. So, yeah, I went down there and I spent an, an entire day with a screen with the movie and he would play the movie and he would tell me what scratches he wanted over that part of the movie and I would have to kind of learn it. Um, and... Even at that point, I remember Daniel saying to me, um, "Look, I'm, I deliver the score to the production to the to the the company who make the movie, right. and I still don't know at that point what they're going to take out and what they're going to leave in because I'm, you know, they've got complete control over what goes in." So he said to me, "I'm pretty sure that your scratching will be in this movie, but I can't guarantee it." Yeah. Anyway, fast forward two months, I went to the. I went to a viewing of the movie with Daniel and the scratching is all throughout the score. It's oh. it's all throughout the whole movie way more than I thought they would put in. Um, in fact, the very first sound of the movie is me doing a scratch and scratching in the, the opening credit music. Um, I know it was the coolest thing ever. I love it. It's like, you know, it, it, that's amazing. That must make you feel so good. It was a great thing to do. And again, it just came, it just came by completely by chance. Um, and just an opportunity that I just grabbed and I'm so glad I did it. It was, it's just one of those things that is just a great thing to do to look back on. And yeah. I know that they've announced the spider verse two. So maybe, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do it for that. We'll see. You maybe i need to. to call daniel come on daniel let's go let's do this um that's what i was wondering is have you done any other work with tv film anything in that world since or worked with daniel or any other composers or is that the only thing up to, to date that's the only thing um that's the only thing i do remember that daniel it, daniel did phone me actually about spider verse 2 um but this was before covid he actually had an idea of doing an event where again this was before covid so you know these yeah. plans were scrapped immediately with lockdown and things like that but he had an idea to do um to basically perform the score from into the spider verse on stage um which would be amazing amazing um, hopefully we could still make that happen maybe even yeah. spider verse 2 because that score is it's fantastic and and people loved it um, I love it. Yeah. And then at, at the end of all that, Daniel, as you mentioned, Daniel got my name on the credits and he told me that he told me that there are so many credits that people really have to fight to get their name in there. And Daniel very kindly fought to get my name in there, which is brilliant. Yeah. Oh, wow. Daniel. You're a real one, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, shoot, I know you have to go. Uh, there was more we wanted to discuss, but uh, we, we, we got to let you go to your thing. There were a couple questions from the internet. Um, do you have maybe a couple minutes we can just hit those real quick and then Absolutely. get out of here? Okay, so um, we've got a UK legend on here, D. James uh from beat source and he asks how you balance your djing with your bakery business is that a joke or is that real <laughs> uh, i so wasn't sure so i'm asking it <laughs> let me explain that one so at the start of lockdown um i i've always been into cooking but at the start of lockdown i really got into baking <laughs> and i if I do say so myself, I make a pretty good focaccia bread, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to try that. <laughs> I I made this once for James, and um, I, I I remember I promised him. I said um, he really really enjoyed it, and I said, "When's your birthday?" I said, "I'll make you one for your birthday," <laughs> and then I think he forgot about it. And then on his birthday, I called him and I said, "I'm sending a focaccia bread round to your house in a taxi, wrapped all you know." <laughs> safe <laughs> and um yeah he he has in the past uh referred to my kitchen as the blakery 
<laughs> the Blakery. Okay, that's genius. Um, all right, your birthday's coming up next week, so I think he owes you a focaccia or something. Some one of your favorite. What's your favorite <laughs> food? What can he send you? Well, um, oh God, that's a good question. I do you know? I don't know if James can cook. So, <laughs> <laughs> what if he just orders it? What, what, what's your favorite? Uh, what's your favorite food? If he wants to order something for me, Turkish all the way. Turkish cuisine. Wow, that's good to know. Okay, what's the best thing from Turkish cuisine? Um, I really like a lot of their sides and their salads. They they always have um, in a Turkish yeah. restaurant. You always get like onions in this like pomegranate sauce with parsley and every Turkish restaurant does it. And that's great. They're really good at doing side Amazing. salads. And then of course, like a mixed grill of some sort, but I'll let, I'll let James decide. Okay. James, <laughs> we're putting the, we're putting the signal out there for you. Um, all right. Two more questions and then let's get out of here. Um, Kenny, I am asks H I D mode for CDJ 3000s release date question mark it's coming i'm afraid i can't give you a date but what okay. i can say is it is 100 percent coming yeah i mean i i'm it's actually interesting that it's that hard to implement in there yeah, yeah. it's um it's we're getting asked about it more and more um right. and it is definitely coming unfortunately i'd love to be able to give you a date but i just yeah. can't right now but it is it's definitely coming. coming and they're working hard on it that's good enough um, okay, last question. DJ Wingman1, does Blakey still carry around records or USBs just in case? Um, I usually do have one USB just with some songs on the root drive. Um, luckily, I've never needed it, actually. But um, it's there just in case I do. Um, vinyl, no. Um, I very rarely use um, even turntables with Serato these days. I do sometimes. Really? at certain venues but very rarely actually i'm i'm hid or controller most of the time now okay that's good to know yeah i've been going coming back into it i've been going back and forth too i was like i want to try this phase okay i'm gonna do hid mode i'm gonna see what's best because they've been outside too so in the daytime and hot um amazing all right well well uh, you've told us so much i feel like there was even more that we want to talk about but maybe one day we'll get that or maybe we'll hear you on your new twitch show telling us uh, a bunch of that info so check that out and um yeah so just a reminder to everyone that beat source and serato are coming together to do these uh three webinars june 23rd june 30th and july 7th uh the first one the 23rd is for the west coast of the united states june 30th for the east coast of the united states and july 7th uh, is geared towards the uk so go sign up at link.beatsource.com slash what's dash next and uh, you'll see blakey up on there and uh, be able to ask questions and learn things and i'm sure there's going to be so much beneficial knowledge um yeah do you have any kind of last words or message or advice for djs or just say hello to somebody out there before we get out of here sign up for the webinar if you're on the east coast the west coast or the uk sign up we also do have plans to do a webinar in other european territories um so stay tuned for that um thank you for having me on it's been a pleasure yes it's been a pleasure too thank you for coming on and uh i will see you see you in the twitch verse and maybe in the real life world one day (laughs) yep you'll see me doing the breaking in stream on the serato channel starting in july so look out for that I can't wait. I'm excited. I love that stuff. All right, Blakey, thank you so much for coming on the 20 podcast. We will talk to you soon. Peace. Okay, that was a fun show. I wish we didn't have to end it so early. I had more things I wanted to ask Blakey about the Spider-Verse scratches and about everything else. Such an interesting dude, really smart, really talented, and I really enjoyed having him on the show. Hopefully I can connect with him in real life. Maybe eat some of his focaccia bread from the bakery. I don't know if I'll be so lucky. But, uh, you know, that was fun. Can't wait to see you guys next week. Thank you for tuning in. I'm DJ Spider. Keep in touch with me at DJ Spider on Instagram or Twitch. DJ S-P-I-D-E-R. The 20 Podcast is produced by BeatSource. Join us next week for more interviews as we discuss music that matters to DJs. I'm signing off. DJ Spider. Peace.